So the very first organ system covered in Biology 223 is the integumentary system. It happens to be the largest organ system that we have in the human body. The integument is also known as the covering, which happens to be the first line of our defense because it is the most exposed of all the organ systems that we have. It accounts for about roughly 7% of the total body weight, which is roughly about 10 to 11 pounds, with a surface area of about 22 square feet. Now note, I'm not expecting you to know the total body weight, much less the surface area. It's just rather interesting numbers or data to, to look at in regards to the integumentary system. So this integumentary system is composed of two major components. So we have the cutaneous membrane, followed by the accessory structures. So what we're going to be doing is covering the cutaneous membrane first, and then we're going to follow that up by looking at the accessory structures. So the first part of the cutaneous membrane, commonly known as the skin, which incidentally, if you remember, the cutaneous membrane is one of the four tissue membranes. So the cutaneous membrane is composed of the epidermis, which is superficial epithelium. So this is the epithelial tissue layer, and of course we know that all epithelial tissue is a vascular, right? So it doesn't have blood vessels that, that directly feed into the epidermis. Then we have the dermis, which is the underlying area of the cutaneous membrane. So this is where we find the connective tissue layer. And the dermis, unlike the epidermis, is vascular. Okay, so it is vascular, while the epidermis is avascular. Now within the dermal layer, or the dermis, which is part of the cutaneous membrane, we have two layers, or two regions. So the first region is the papillary layer. So this accounts for about 20% of the dermis. Deep to the papillary layer is the reticular layer, which we can also refer to as the reticular region. And this makes up roughly about 80%. So what I've done is I've made a drawing over here on the right that basically diagrams or illustrates the cutaneous membrane. So we have the exposed surface, right, because we're talking about our skin, the integument, and we have the epidermis, which is your epithelial tissue layer, avascular, and then deep to the epidermis is the dermis. So I've illustrated here the papillary layer followed by the reticular layer. So once again, folks, the papillary layer is about 20% of the dermis, and the deeper reticular layer is about 80%. So please note, the papillary layer is the superficial layer of the dermis, and the reticular layer is the deeper layer of the dermis. Now, directly deep to the dermis is a region called the hypodermis. So let's talk about the hypodermis. So the hypodermis, if we break this word down, hypo means below, all right? So hypo means below dermis, totally appropriate. And of course, just like a lot of uh, terms in anatomy, there are other names given to the same structure. So in other words, the hypodermis is also referred to as the subcutaneous, it's also referred to as the sub-Q, and it's also referred to as the superficial fascia. So I would like you to know these other names given to the hypodermis. Now, please note, the hypodermis is not part of the integumentary system, right? So it is not part of the cutaneous membrane. It is a region that is directly deep to the dermis. But please note, the hypodermis, subcutaneous, sub-Q, or superficial fascia are not or is not part of the integumentary system. All right, now, I also made an additional drawing over here. And once again, we have the surface, right? This is the exposed. So we have the superficial epidermis, where we find epithelial tissue, and directly deep to that is the dermis, which I did not label. All right, so we have two parts. We have the epidermal ridge, which I like to refer to as the valley, and then we have this mound-like structure called the dermal papilla. So the mound is the dermal papilla, while the valley is the epidermal ridge. Now, if we're only looking at one mound, then we call that dermal papilla. If we're looking at two or more mounds, then we refer to this as dermal papillae. So I'm just going to write the plural, papillae. All right, so that's the plural form of papilla. So papilla is singular, 
and papali is plural. Okay, now we'll also cover the accessory structures. So the accessory structures is the second major component of the integumentary system. So what are some of the accessory structures? Well, we have the hair, we have the nails, and we have what are called exocrine glands, which are all multicellular glands, right? Made up of glandular epithelium. So we're gonna look at the sebaceous gland, commonly known as the oil glands, that produces sebum, which is oil. We have the ceruminous glands, which is, produces cerumen, in other words, earwax. And we have the sudoriferous glands, commonly known as your sweat glands. And this produces sweat. Now there are two types of pseudoriferous or sweat glands. We have the merocrine, also called the eccrine sweat glands, and the apocrine sweat glands, which we will cover later on in this pr presentation. Okay, so we have the sebaceous glands, the ruminous glands, the pseudoriferous glands. These are all exocrine glands that are part of the accessory structures of the integumentary system. So this slide shows us a sectional view of our skin. I'm not going to bother pointing every single one out to you, some of which, by the way, you're identifying in lab. So we're just going to briefly go over this image, but I just want to point out the cutaneous membrane, right? We have the uh, epidermis and we have the dermis. So within the epidermis, of course, we have the epithelial layer, and that's avascular, and deep to that is the dermis, the connective tissue layer which we know is vascular. And we also know that within the dermis, we have the superficial papillary region or papillary layer and the deeper reticular layer or reticular region. So we know that this makes up about 20% of the dermis and this makes up about 80%. So within the papillary region, we have areolar connective tissue, one of the loose connective tissue that we described in the last chapter. The reticular region or reticular layer is made up of dense, irregular collagenous connective tissue. So this is definitely not loose connective tissue. This is dense. It's densely packed with collagen fibers that go in many different directions, and that's why it's irregular. And of course, we also remember that both areolar connective tissue and dense, irregular collagenous connective tissue are examples of connective tissue proper, with the predominant cell being the fibroblast that secretes the components of the extracellular matrix and as well as the connective tissue fibers. And directly deep to the dermis, we have the subcutaneous layer, which we know is also referred to as the hypodermis, the sub-Q, the superficial fascia. And it is not, once again, part of the integumentary system. So this layer is where we're going to find adipose tissue, basically fat tissue. So more on the subcutaneous layer, hypodermis, sub -Q, superficial fascia, when we actually get to that part of the presentation. So let's now look at the cutaneous membrane, specifically the epidermis, which is the superficial epithelium. So this is composed of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So it's multiple layers, it's stratified, with the apical layer of cells being squamous, and of course it's epithelial. It relies on diffusion of nutrients and oxygen from capillaries, which we'll talk about later. These are basically blood vessels that we find in the dermis. So remember, because of the fact that this is epithelial tissue, it does not have direct blood supply. There are no direct blood vessels that supply the epidermis. So it's going to have to rely on diffusion of nutrients and oxygens from the blood vessels that we find in the dermis, right? The dermis is the connective tissue part of the cutaneous membrane. Now, what we find predominantly in the epidermis are cells called keratinocytes. Now, some folks pronounce it as keratinocytes, which are fine, but I go back and forth between keratinocytes or keratinocytes. So this is the predominant cells that we find in the epidermis, which incidentally happens to be epithelial cells. All right, so we're giving these epithelial cells that we find in the epidermis a special name. We are calling them keratinocytes or keratinocytes. Now, they produce the protein keratin. So keratin, which I've illustrated or I've included rather, an image of keratin right over here. So keratin is a rope-like protein, just like collagen fibers. So keratin, once again, is a protein.
which form a rope-like structure, very much like collagen. So these keratinocytes will produce this keratin. And this is why we end up with an epidermis that's made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now, in addition to producing keratin, they also contain inside their cytoplasm specialized organelles. These are specialized organelles that are referred to as lamellar granules or lamellar bodies. Now, folks, these are not your typical organelles that you find in a typical eukaryotic cell. These are found within these keratinocytes, these epithelial cells of the epidermis. So inside the lamellar granules or bodies are stacks of lipids, right? These lipids are flat, so they're kind of like pancakes. So to sort of get a visual on this, imagine you have a stack of pancakes, and these are the multiple layers of these flat-like lipids that we find inside each of these lamellar granules or lamellar bodies. And once again, these are specialized organelles found in the cytoplasm of these keratinocytes. So what are they doing there? Well, you'll see later on. Now I want to go back to the discussion of keratin. So we have two forms of keratin. We have hard keratin that make up our hair and our nails, and we have soft keratin that we find in our skin. So it's just basically the way that this rope-like protein, this keratin, is bundled together. How they're organized will make the difference whether they're hard or soft. But remember, they're made up of this protein, keratin, that these keratinocytes produce. Now, what do we find in the epidermis? We know it's stratified squamous epithelium, keratinized, of course. It turns out that we have five layers, okay? Now, the layers are referred to as strata. So strata means layers. So if we're looking at multiple layers, then we refer to it as strata. If we're looking at one layer, then it's referred to as stratum. Now, some folks say strata or stratum, I say strata, stratum. So this means one layer, all right? So we have five strata when it comes to the epidermis. Now, note, there is an exception, okay? So we're gonna talk about which stratum is not universal, and as we don't find it for a particular type of skin. All right, so the way I'm doing this is we're gonna start off with the deepest layer and we're gonna work our way up to the superficial layer. So in other words, we're gonna start, start with the deepest stratum and work our way to the superficial stratum. So that deepest layer or deepest stratum is the stratum basale or the stratum germanativum, okay? So you could either say stratum basale or stratum germanativum, it means the same thing. Once again, we're starting with the deepest layer followed by the stratum spinosum, followed by the stratum granulosum, followed by the stratum lucidum. Now take note, this stratum lucidum, ladies and gentlemen, is only found in thick skin. Okay, so we're gonna talk about thick skin versus thin skin later on. For now, this is enough to know. So once again, the stratum lucidum is only found in thick skin. Then we have the most superficial stratum, of our epidermis, and that is the stratum corneum. Okay, so this is the most superficial layer. So I have this acronym that helps me remember the five strata. It's come, let us get sunburn. So if we uh, write this down, we have the B for the basale, all right, the stratum basale, and I'm gonna number it in accordance to what I have listed up above. And then the S is the stratum spinosum, the G is the granulosum, stratum granulosum. The L is the stratum lucidum. And finally, the superficial stratum corneum, which is number five, All right? So five strata, and again, the stratum lucidum only found in thick skin. Okay, so let's now talk about the four principal cell types that we find in the epidermis. So we're gonna begin with the keratinocytes or keratinocytes, and this, ladies and gentlemen, once again, is epithelial cell. It's the predominant epithelial cell, the predominant cell, for that matter, found in the epidermis. Then we have the melanocyte, then we have the intraepidermal macrophage, which is also referred to as the Langerhans cell, which is also referred to as the dendritic. So let's go ahead and write that down. So dendritic 
cell. So once again, intraepidermal macrophage, also called the Langerhans cell, also called the dendritic cell. So many different names for this one cell. And then we have the fourth uh, cell type found in the epidermis, and this is your tactile epithelial cell. And of course, it shouldn't be a shocker that we have another name given for this tactile epithelial cell, and that is the Merkel cell, okay? And of course, there's still another name that we can also call this tactile epithelial cell, also known as the Merkel cell. We can refer to it as the tactile cell. So whatever you call it, whether it's tactile epithelial cell, Merkel cell, or tactile cell, once again, ladies and gentlemen, it is the same cell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this tactile cell, tactile epithelial cell, or Merkel cell. So it's highlighted in green, and then we'll put an arrow so there's no question that this is the tactile epithelial cell, Merkel cell, or tactile cell. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier, the keratinocytes is an epithelial cell, and this, too, is an epithelial Okay, so we have two different types of epithelial cell. We have got the keratinocytes, and then we have this tactile cell. So as far as their numbers, please note we have way more keratinocytes. Okay, so they far outnumber the tactile epithelial cell or Merkel cell or tactile cell. So the predominant cell is the keratinocytes, which again is an epithelial cell. Now. Associated with this tactile epithelial cell, or Merkel cell, or tactile cell, is the tactile disc, okay? Tactile disc, so be careful. You've got tactile disc, and you've got tactile cell. Now, we can also refer to this tactile disc as Merkel disc, okay? Now, when in the world is this? Well, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a neuron. So, neurons are nerve cells. So, we've got two very different cell types going on here. We've got the tactile cell, which is epithelial, and then we've got neuron, which is a nerve cell. So they come together as a package, right? So they're bundled together. So what are they doing there? Well, they're there because they are sensitive to light touch and superficial pressure. This is what allows us to feel a feather stroking our skin. So they're very, very sensitive to light touch and superficial pressure. Now note, these tactile epithelial cells do not produce keratin, okay? They do not produce keratin. That's not what they're there for. They're there, again, for light touch and superficial pressure. It's the keratinocytes, the other type of epithelial cell found in the epidermis that produces the keratin. So I, I want to make sure we're stressing that, okay? And this image on this side just basically just shows us the different layers of the strata that we're gonna get ready to talk about, and as well as the four principal cell types of the epidermis, okay? So if we just quickly look at this, here is my tactile disc, okay, my tactile epithelial cell. Here's my intraepidermal macrophage, which again, also referred to as Langerhans cells, also called dendritic cell. Here's my melanocyte, and of course, we can't forget the keratinocytes.